Welcome to Our Halfling, where we talk about Lord of the Rings and a little bit about D&D. So let's get to it. Today we're going over chapter 3 of The Coming of the Elves and the Captivity of Melkor and chapter 4 of Thingol and Melion. So, our story begins with the Valar still being in total bliss and ignorance <laughs> in Valinor, just doing their thing, just living life. And only Arome and Yavanna are coming to Middle-earth to check on it and to see how things are. And Yavanna is really grieving and mourning over everything that has been lost since the spring of Arda. And what she has been able to, she has put to sleep things that she was able to save and so that they could awake when the time was needed. Now Melkor during this time is growing <laughs> strong and powerful. Um, the beings that he corrupted early on are getting stronger and those are the Balrogs and yeah he's in control at this point and he has created a fortress or an armory at the north western shores of the sea to keep uh, a resistance basically for the if ever the Valar try to attack and this fortress is called um, Angban and it is commanded by his lieutenant Sauron. Now during this time Yavanna and Arome are still trying to urge the Valar to go back to Middle Earth and take care of Melkor and correct everything, get everything prepared for the firstborn. And they finally wear the council down enough where all the Valar come together to listen to what Yavanna has to say. And she basically says like, look, we don't know exactly the time that the children of Luvatar are to be coming, but we know what's going to be soon and Melkor is still there. Do we really want to risk the children of Luvatar either being killed by Melkor, being in fear of Melkor, or even calling Melkor Lord? Do, is that what we want to do? And Tolkis, of course, is like, no, let's fight him, because that's Tolkis' thing. <laughs> and Manwe brings in Mandos and asks him for his advice. And Mandos uh, basically says, like, this is the age of the children of Luvatar, and when they awake, they'll first see the stars and the great light will be their waning and Varda is who they'll call for to need for need. And so now Varda um, goes out to the height of Teniquitil and looks out on Middle Earth, which is dark, like her stars aren't lighting up that much. And so she creates brighter and stronger stars and it says that she begins a great labor greatest of all the works of Valar since they're coming into Arda and she takes the silver dew from the from um, Telperion and uses this to make her brighter stars to guide the the firstborn and the name of the stars are Carnil and Luanil, Nenar and Lambar, Alcarnique and Elamire. And she also creates stars that are a sign. So, which are the Wildwaren, Telumendil, Sorunume, and An Narima, and Menel Markar. And she also gives a warning out to Melkor. And she sets the crown of seven mighty stars to swing, Valakirka, the sickle of the Valar, and sign of doom. And so this takes her quite a long time to create. And during the making of the stars, um, particularly Menel Markar, um, during this hour is when the children of Iluvatar awake, when the firstborn awake. And the elves awake by uh, Kuvenin, which is a lake, and it is called the Water of Awakening. 
And here they, the elves awake and they see the stars that Varda has created. And uh, the chapter goes on to say that Kyuvenin basically no longer exists, that after time, you know, landscapes change and Kyuvenin has been lost, um, but that it was once at the roots of the mountain Eluin and um, that they knew the sound of water flowing and these were like water was the first sound that they heard. And so the uh, elves are awake. No one is aware that the elves are here. And so they're just kind of in wonder and awe. And they begin to create their language. And they call themselves the Quendi, which signifies those that speak with voices. Uh, because so far they haven't met anything else that talks. And so... They have learned how to talk. They're now they're creating songs, and it is just by chance that while Arome was doing one of his rides through Middle Earth, he hears singing, and he goes to check out where the singing is coming from, and he finds the elves, and he is in awe at their beauty. And the chapter talks about how the um the elder children of Iluvatar were stronger and greater than they were later on, but not more fair, that over time the elves became more fair, that their sorrow and wisdom enriched their beauty. And so Arome now loves the Quendi, and he names them the Eldar, or the people of the stars, and he names them from their own tongue. Now, the... Quendi are very afraid of Arome when they first meet him. Um, during this time of absence from the Valar, um, Melkor has stricken fear into the elves. He's kind of kept in the shadows, but the elves know that if any one of them ever wanders too far from the group, that the hunter will capture them. And so many elves have been lost during this time and so when they see Arome they are worried that he's the hunter and um it kind of sounds a little bit like either Melkor has hired or like has sent out servants to imitate Arome or that maybe he's been imitating Arome but either way the intention is to make the elves fear Arome so when the Quendi hear Nahar, his horse, neighing, they run and hide. And a few of them, though, do stay. It says that the noblest of the elves were drawn towards him because they could see that this great rider was not of darkness. They could see that he had the light of Amon or the light of Valinor in his face. And so, uh, so they, they draw closer. Now the chapter talks about here that the the elves that were taken from Melkor or are taken by Melkor, um, these elves have been tortured and treated with extreme cruelty to the point that he has made the orcs from these elves. And that um, Melkor has no ability to make life on his own or even a resemblance of life in the way that Aule made the dwarves, that Melkor has no ability to do that. And all he has done is corrupted the elves and that this is his most vilest deed and his most hateful thing that he could have done to Luvatar. So um, Arome stays with the Quendi for uh, a little while, but he does swiftly go back to Valinor, tells the Valar of what's going on, says, hey, the elves have awakened and some of them are being taken by Melkor. We need to do something. And then he says, peace out and goes back to the elves. While the Valar are like, yay, the elves have been awoken. Oh no, what are we supposed to do about Melkor? <laughs> and so Manwe goes and he kind of goes into prayer and to counsel with the Luvatar and kind of sees what is their next step. And so Manwe eventually comes back to the Valar and says, you know, uh, 
I've gone into council with Louvatar, and he has said that we need to take back Arda, that we need to fight and 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 rescue the Quindi from Melkor. And Tolkis, of course, is like, yeah, fighting. Aule is like, oh, the destruction. Aule is just thinking of everything that he's created that's going to be destroyed and what he might have to repair. So he's not as excited. However, the Valar are in agreement that this is something that does need to be done. So the Valar get together and they get ready for war. And because of this, Melkor, no surprise, hates the elves because he blames them for his downfall. However, the elves never have anything to do with the battle of the powers. Like, they are essentially unaware, really, because the Valar come to Middle-earth and they run into Angban, that's the first place that they hit. That's the first victory. And the, you know, the servants of Melkor, they all flee to Atumno. And while the Valar are heading that way too, uh, they send guards to Cuvenet to guard the elves. And so the elves have no idea really what's happening. The only thing that they are aware of is sort of the aftershocks of all the fighting. So they, a lot of the landscape has been uh, destroyed and has been changed. Um, but they they get to Atumno and they, through a lot of fighting and wielding of fires and destruction, uh, they're eventually able to take Atumno down. And uh, Tolkis comes out the champion and is able to capture and wrestle down Melkor. And with the chain that Aule has made from, uh, they are able to take Melkor captive. And it does say that not every vault and cavern of Atumno or even Angban was checked and that there was a lot of evil things left behind, including Sauron. And so um, the Valar now take Melkor back to Valinor and they take him to the Ring of Doom and which is their like the council kind of and Melkor falls to his feet and begs Manwe for pardon which of course Manwe is like no so uh, he's sent to prison in Mandos and it says that the prison that he is in is so inescapable that no elf man or Valar can escape from this place and that Melkor is doomed to stay here for three long ages so now, you know, the battle's won, Melkor is dealt with, but the Valar are like, okay, well, what do we do about, what do we do about the Quindy? What do we do about all the elves? And Olmo, who doesn't usually come to council anyways, so the fact that he's here is kind of a big deal, but Olmo is like, leave them where they're at. Let them walk freely in Middle-earth, let them learn their skills, let them learn to heal and to heal the land, and he kind of gives off more of a uh, let's meet them kind of thing. Like, this is where they need to be. Let them be there. And the rest of the Valar, it says that they're mostly in fear for the Quindi, but also that they love their beauty. And so the rest of the Valar are like, no, bring them here to us. That's the much better option. It's too dangerous in Middle Earth. They need to be here. And the Valar eventually all come to agreement like, yeah, okay, they bring them to Valinor. And Mondos, who's been silent this whole time, finally breaks his silence saying, so it is doomed. And from this summons came many woes that afterwards befell. So the, uh, the Valar, or particularly Arome, goes to the elves and says, hey, come with us to Valinor. And the elves are unwilling at first they do not want to go the only valor that they have seen outside of war is a Rome. everybody else they've only seen the wrathful side of the valor so of course they're saying no i'm not gonna go that's insane and so a Rome comes in and says okay 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 how about we just send some ambassadors we'll send three ambassadors and they can check things out and then come back and tell you guys about it and so the elves are like yeah, that sounds good. So they send Ingwe, Fenway, and Elway to go to uh, Valinor. 
and they get there and they are in awe of the beauty and the wonder of everything. So they come back and say, yes, we've got to get to Valinor. That's where we need to be. And so now begins the journey west towards Valinor. And the el- so the elves are now going to be broken up into three main groups. And Engwe is the first and smallest host to go to Valinor. And his group is called the Vanyar. And when they get to Valinor, they stay in Valinor. Very few of, the, of that group ever comes back to Middle-earth. And that, uh, in any way, is, it says he sits at the feet of the powers and all elves revere his name. Uh, he never comes back. And it says that very few men have ever spoken to any of the Banyar. Uh, the next group is the Noldor. And they are a name of wisdom. They are led by Fenway, and they are the deep elves. And these elves are favored most by uh, Aule. And uh, the Vanyar are beloved most by Manwe and Varda. And then your last big group is the Teleri. And this group is so large that it's actually um, led by two people, Elwe uh, Singolo, which uh, signifies Grey Mantle, and Olwe, his brother. Now, there was a group at the beginning when everybody's like, let's go to the West. There was a group that said, no, we have no desire to make that journey. We have no desire to leave Middle Earth. And that group was called the Advari, the unwilling. And so they they stay in Middle Earth and the Eldar, which are the, the group of elves that go to Valinor, uh, they don't see the Advari for a very long time for uh, it says for many ages and of the group of the Tellery, which was the last and largest group that group uh, they are much slower to get to Valinor and when they get to the mountains um, Erluin, they there is a group that's like no I changed my mind I don't want to do this and that group is called the Umanyar. So the Avari and the Umanyar are the two groups of elves that never go to um, Valinor. And these are called the Moikwendi, elves of the darkness. While the rest of the elves that do go to Valinor are called the Kalequendi, elves of the light. So here we start looking closer at the, the journey to the west. And for the most part, the elves are very slow (laughs) to get over there for a few reasons. One, nobody's taken this journey outside of Arome. So the elves aren't exactly prepared to make this long journey. So they're kind of slow in that sense because there's no path. They're also slower because they don't really trust any of the other Valar for one at this point. Also... They don't know where they're going. So Arome is the one leading all these elves west. And if at any point or reason he needs to leave, the elves stay where they're at. They do not move until Arome returns to guide them. So that's another reason. The last reason is that the elves are in such wonder and awe of the world around them that they're really taking their time moving forward because they want to know this land that they've just woken up in so they do take quite a time to to go and also some of the elves are a little reluctant to go like they can see what's in front of them they can see the world around them and they're not really sure about the rumors of the trees and so some of them are a little more reluctant to go so this journey takes them years to make uh the tellery because it was broken up into two groups one of the groups uh owe i believe it's his son lenway uh, takes a group and says uh, we changed our mind we don't want to go and so this group ends up going southwards and they are called the nandor uh, and these people are very much 
apart from the rest of the elves. Uh, and the only thing that they said that they have in common with the other elves is their love for water. So, um, the Vanyar and the Noldor get to um, Valinor quite easily. No issues. Everything's fine. The Tellery take a little bit longer. And um, at one point, Orome actually leaves to go to Valinor for counsel. And so the Tellery are left at the river uh, Gelion. So, Cuvenin is far east of, and it's at the root of the mountains Aluin. And so the elves are having to travel west for a while. Then there's mountains Ered Luin. And then after the mountains, there's like a bunch of branches of rivers. And the longest river is uh, River Gelion. And this river is where the Tellery sit for quite some time. And this leads us into chapter four of Thingol Melion. So as a little refresher, Melion was a Maiar who served under um, Lorien and her skill was in songs of enchantment. And she, uh, nightingales always were with her. And it says that uh, Melian was akin to Yavanna before the world. So, uh, when the Quendi were waking up at Cuavenin, Melian went to Middle Earth, and she filled the silence with her with her songs, and teaching the birds songs. And so, while the Tellery are in or sitting by River Gelion. Melion is in the forest, not Elmoth. And so I, I will put up a map right here. So you have non Elmoth, and then you have the forest, uh, Neldoreth and region. And in these forests was, was Fenway. And so Elway was close friends with Fenway. And so he would travel back and forth from River Gelion to the forest to meet with Fenway. Because they're all kind of traveling at the same time, but they're like, they're in different sections. And so during one of his journeys to visit Fenway, he gets distracted. He hears some singing. And so he wanders and follows the singing under an enchantment and goes into um, non Elmoth. And here he sees Melion standing in darkness, but he sees the light of Amon, uh, the light of Valinor in her face. And it says that they don't speak any words, they don't see each other, but Elwe is filled with love for her and he goes up to her takes her hand and straight away a spell is laid on him and here they stand for years it says and that uh the years were measured by the wheeling stars above them and the trees of non elmoth grew tall and dark before they spoke a word so they're just standing here for years he's completely enchanted by her to the point where the rest of the Tellery are looking for him they're like where the heck has Elway gone what is happening and Elway eventually ends up taking over all of the Tellery and they they all go on to Valinor without Elway <laughs> and uh so Melion and Elway end up uh becoming king and queen of a whole new set of elves and these elves are they have a strand of Ainur in them and they are the Sindar and these are the elder of Belrion which this whole land uh, past the Ered Luin all the way to the western shores is Bel Belrion, which is what the elves call this land. And so uh, Melion and Elwe uh, become king of king and queen of this 
area or part of it. And uh, Elway changes his name to Thingol. Melion becomes his queen. And it says that uh, they were wiser than, it says, any child of Middle Earth. And their hidden halls were in Menorgroth, the Thousand Caves in Doriath. And here, the Sindar, or Sindar um, are the fairest of the children of Iluvatar. And from this branch, you eventually get the Dunedain. And it says that Elwë never went back to Valinor. Melion never went back to Valinor until after their, their realm together, after their reign together. And that while the Sindar were considered the Moriquendi because they never saw the light of um, the uh, the light of Amon and the light of Valinor's, uh, Elwë was not considered a part of this because he did see the light. So he is a Calaquendi. So yeah, so that is your our two chapters for this week. This is a lot. I really want to make sure I got the story straight for you guys. I really liked it. There are a ton of names, a ton of branches. So we'll just do a quick little recap. You have the Eldar, which are the Vanyar, Noldar, and Teleri that see the, that they, these are the ones that travel, basically. They are the, the elves that travel. And of the Vanyar, Noldar, and Teleri that actually get to Valinor, and see the the two trees they are called the Calakindi Calakindi of the elves that did not even take the journey they are called the Advari so the Teleri and get broken up as well you have the Sindar which are uh, of um, Elwë and Melion and then you have the Nandor that end up going southwards. These guys leave. See, those that left the March of the Tellery east of the Misty Mountains. Um, and from there, you also get the Laquendi, which we kind of just grazed over. And the Sindar and the Nandor are called the Umanyar. And these are Eldars who did not go to Valinor. So they're still considered part of the Eldar because they traveled. So that's why they're not considered an Avari. Um, and the Sindar, Nandor, and the Avari are all called Moriquendi because they are elves of the darkness. These are elves that didn't go at all, except for Elwë, who is still counted as a Calaquendi. So yeah, that was a lot. It was a lot. But... There you go. So now we actually got the story of the Eldar and their journey and the awakening of the elves. So I hope you guys liked it. I hope I kept the story straight enough for you guys. I enjoyed it. I, um, yeah, I like getting to see all the different types of elves and why everybody gets their names and where all that's from. So it was good. I enjoyed this. I hope you guys enjoyed the story and I hope you guys have a good week. So, may the hairs on your toes never fall out. Bye.